listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocus Radio. We are here once again today. Man, we have another show and we have a special guest with us today. Like always, we have Anna Meg Reller Savelli, and she's going to tell us everything about her life's journey. She has a website that you can go to. It is cpofatl.com. It's all about Christian professionals of Atlanta. Today's focus is going to be finding your purpose. She has an awesome story that she's going to share with us today. But first, we're going to get to know a little bit more about Anna. So first of all, thank you for your time. How are you doing? Hi, thank you so much for having me on the show. Um, I'm very excited to um, share my journey today. Well, we appreciate you being on, uh, sharing the story with us. So kind of tell the audience a little bit about yourself being the founder of the Christian Professionals of Atlanta and a little bit before that. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, stories matter, right? And gives uh, context to um, listeners of where I came from and where I am now. Um, So I am actually originally from Eastern Europe, the country Georgia, which is ironic because now I live in the state Georgia. So lots of jokes are being made often when I say that from Georgia to Georgia. Um, I um, grew up in um, pretty, you know, volatile environment, um, very poor background. And so I knew from very young age, I wanted a bigger life than where I was born was offering me. And I knew I was going to do anything possible to um, get to where I want to be. When I was growing up for women, there were really two ways out of poverty. It, it's either marrying somebody up uh, from a higher class or um, education. Um, I did not want to go with the first route. So I knew that I had to really work really hard to get education, to get out of poverty um, that I was growing up. So I, um, got accepted into Berea College in Berea, Kentucky in 2008. It was the only college I applied to. um, And it was very unique because every student who goes to that college goes there for free. Their tuition is completely covered. And obviously, because of my financial background, that was my only option to come to the U.S. to get a better education. And um, I applied and I got in. Um, And so um, I was supposed to come to the U.S. in August of 2008. And um, some of the listeners might know back in 2008, Georgia was actually invaded by Russia. And there was a five day war where my hometown, Gori, was completely destroyed by bombs. And my flight was on day three of that five day war. um, And uh, I was out of the country by the only flight. All flights were canceled except um, Georgian Airways um, was mandated by the president to continue operating. And so I was on that flight. And um, it was an interesting um, experience because you have this torn feelings, right? A sense of relief that I'm leaving, I'm, I'm going to start a new life in in the U.S., but at the same time, you know, worrying about my family, about my friends, and feeling guilty, too, that I'm leaving while they're stuck in the country in the midst of the war. So it was a very challenging um, time to leave, um, but, you know, I, I, I got out, came to Kentucky. I got my degree, my education. I focused really hard to, you know, get my education. I got my master's. I always worked. And um, it's common um, for immigrants who come to this country to really focus on wealth acquisition, especially if we come from meager backgrounds, right? And we're often expected to support our entire family back home. And so that was the case for me, too. Um, I was supporting my family. I was working. I was climbing that corporate ladder. I was very successful in sales career. So I had about 10 years of different um, sales jobs where I eventually grew in my career to where I managed large sales departments, right? 
And if you're successful in sales, you can make a lot of money. So by the time, um, you know, 10 years into my career, I really, there was not much I couldn't afford, right? I was earning good living. I was, I was living the dream. And so I had this big dream that I wanted to buy this condo in the middle of the city, overlooking the city, right? And I achieved that in 2020. And about a month after I moved in into my place, I was sitting on the couch and I was like, huh, that did not bring me the fulfillment that I really was looking for. So, okay, what's going on? I thought I would be happy achieving this big milestone in my life and it's really not bringing me the fulfillment. And so that kind of started the journey of me figuring out like, I'm not really happy with this life. I Something is really not clicking, right? I, yes, I was successful. Yes, I was supporting my family, but I really felt like my job was not contributing to this world, right? I wanted something where I could find meaning and find purpose. And so it took a while, right? So it's, it was almost a year and a half later when I finally got to the tipping point of deciding I really cannot continue this way anymore. I need to find my purpose. And so fast forward to February of 2022, I give my two week notice uh, and I decide I'm going to take a year of sabbatical to really focus on finding my purpose, finding my meaning and finding my happiness, right? And so I jokingly call it my own version of eat, pray, love journey that I went through. So I traveled to about 12 countries through that year because I just wanted to even find out, do I really want to live in the U.S., right? I was completely open to moving anywhere in the world where where the journey would take me. I was willing to move. Um, so I kind of wanted to explore different countries and see if 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 I want to move there. So that was part of it. Um, second part was I wanted to really heal um, a lot of parts that came from my childhood, right? So I left Georgia and I almost never looked back. I didn't really enjoy going back. Yes, I wanted to see the family, but I felt very disconnected about my where I'm from and my culture. And I realized that I really can't find my own happiness and fulfillment until I heal where I come from, right? You can't really love yourself until you love every part of yourself, including that trauma, including where you come from. So I focused a lot on kind of um, looking and learning about my culture, about my country, as if it's for the first time. And it really, really opened my mind to the beauty of where I came from. And now the beauty of I have grown and now I have this beautiful life in the United States. And then I went through different kind of challenging um, steps throughout the journey where I went on four different silent retreats at different monasteries. Um, And if... (laughs) You ever, if you've never done this, it's an interesting experience because not only you're completely quiet for, you know, five days at a time, you don't have access to any um, cell phone. Um, it's really you're left by yourself, right? And for the first two days, it's almost like you're going through this detox. Um, I, I felt very tired and and restless at the same time. And then something really starts happening on the third day of that stay where you start growing um, and going into inwards and learning about yourself. And so on the first um, silent retreat, I didn't have cell phone, but I did have a laptop with no internet connection. And I wrote my book in two days while I was at that silent retreat. So my book is now published and it's called uh, Finding Courage to Change. And the reason why I wrote this book is I wanted to really talk about the importance of breaking generational trauma violence. It doesn't happen often. Most of the time, people continue with that cycle. And I was the cycle breaker, right? I came to this country. I wanted to start a new life. 
So I wanted to really use the past trauma for the good so that it does have a purpose. So the first part of the finding purpose was that, is that I decided anything that's happened to me that was bad from my past is going to be used for the good for present and the future. So that became part of the purpose that was found um, through that year. Second time I went on this uh, silent retreat, I had an amazing epiphany and kind of like a vision that was given to me during prayer where um, the idea of Christian professionals of Atlanta was born. At the beginning, it was very overwhelming. Like I just remember I just kind of broke down and sobbed and I said, this is so big. I don't know how to start. I'm nobody. How can I how can I really do it? Um, and uh was very overwhelmed by the idea, right? I'm, I really felt I'm just a saleswoman, right? Like, how can I start something so much bigger than myself? But then, you know, people come and people support your idea. And then um, the saying, when you build it, they will come, right? That exactly what happened. So Christian Professionals started um, in January of 2023, And the idea was that, you know, let's bring a community of everybody. You know, you can be a Christian. You don't have to be a Christian, but really base the organization on the beautiful Christian values, such as servant heart and supporting the community, loving, accepting, helping. Um, And so we really focused on philanthropy. So every time we host a meeting and we have monthly meetings, we bring a different nonprofit um, that shares the mission with our, you know, attendees, with our members. Um, we really support them. And now we also have um, nonprofit members for whom we um, host fundraisers. So we just had our first uh, big fundraiser for two nonprofit members where, you know, we really talked about their mission. We raised a lot of money for them. So now the idea is that we are known in the community as an organization that truly focuses on bringing impact and supporting local nonprofits. And so, you know, suddenly I come from not really knowing what my purpose is and being unhappy with my job to for a fast forward today where I am working on something so much bigger than myself. Um, I would, there's nothing else I would, I would rather do than what I'm doing now. Um, I'm sharing the mission of this organization with people. Um, and the big vision and that I have is that, you know, five years down the road, I have this big map of the United States hanging in my office um, with pins and major cities throughout the U.S. where we now have chapters um, throughout the U.S. So it's no longer just Christian professionals of Atlanta. Now it's Christian professionals of America, right? Because there's such a need for um, strong community bonds between the members, between people, and also supporting um, nonprofits that are in that community. So, yeah, this is kind of a snapshot of a journey of where I came from and um, where I'm now. Talking to our guest, Anna Meg Relish Billy. And when you look at the opportunities that you have to bring people mm-hmm. together, I mean, these are businesses, professionals. Right. I mean, that's very unique because you think about business of commerce and how that operates, this is slightly similar, but is more focused on community and Christian values. What has been some of the response to people who have been members with your organization? What have they shared with you, um, Mm -hmm. their feedback? Yeah, so it's interesting. um, Some of the feedback that I've received was that um, some women have come to me and said that they felt safe for the first time attending a networking event, which was really reassuring because um, we are really trying to build a community that is supportive of each other. So we have a very specific role where we only allow 
um, non-members to come three times, and then they either have to make a commitment to become a member or they can no longer come. And the reason behind this rule is that we want eliminate people who are going to become users, right? Because we are curating a very elite group of business professionals of the city, right? They're business, half of my members are business owners, right? They're like high earners. They are powerful people. And now we jointly come together and now we can make this much bigger impact on our community. So I think that rule eliminates a lot of that um, uncertainty and unfamiliarity with attendees. So that creates safe environment. Another feedback that I've received is that I think um, people crave um, community beyond just their churches, right? Beyond just um, sharing their faith on Sundays. And um, the now, basically the professionals group often gets overlooked in churches. So there's really not much programming for young professionals or even, you know, mid, mid-level mid professionals. And so, but they still crave that um, sense of belonging community that our organization provides to them. And then third, I think people really, really appreciate an opportunity to have that ability to share their faith outside of the church, right? So there's oftentimes there's a taboo about talking about your faith in corporate world. Um, well, suddenly there's this new organization that normalizes having business conversations, having this partnerships that grow and develop through our networking events. But at the same time, it's completely normal for you to talk about what church you go to or, you know, what have you been struggling with in your faith? Um, and then thirdly, I think some people who are curious about um, what's so different about, you know, Christianity, we do have people who are not believers who come, but they see there's a difference in in just the attitude between each other and how we treat them and how we welcome them. And um, and then that also answers some of their questions that might be seeking. So it's kind of a, a general um, feedback that I receive. When it comes to your events for uh, networking with professionals, what are the criteria requirements for people who are new and they want to uh, visit? Like you said, they have up to three times and then they need to become a member. Is there any um, requirements one has to go through before they can just show up to an event? So not as a guest. As a guest, um, I guess the only thing is that you have to have graduated college and it, you need, it needs to be before you retire. So you need to be in a professional um, field and in any area. Um, so there's really not uh, anything else beyond that. Now, when we do have somebody wanting to join as a member, we do run, um, you know, some background check like on LinkedIn, their social media, just to see, make sure that they are a, a good fit. So far, it's really been growing very organically through word of mouth. So it's very rare for us to get somebody off the street. It's typically somebody who already is a member or has been brings another friend. So it's automatically like it's growing by vetting um, through the community itself. Um, so I think that also contributes to that factor of safety because we now nobody is really, you know, unknown who comes to that organization. Um, it's really people um, who either know us through somebody else or I know them personally, um, and then they they decide to join. You mentioned earlier that they don't have to necessarily be a Christian to to join. So what if someone's listening to this and like, well, I don't have a college degree? But I did start my business. Is yes, there a they, way you look they, at that? They as don't well? have, yeah, yeah. They don't have to have a college degree. What I'm saying is that they need to be in the professional field. So, like, um, you know, if you are retired or if you're just a student or if you're, um, you know, then probably not a great fit because of what we're trying to achieve. But if you are looking for a job, right, great opportunity to network and get a job. Um, or if um, you are, you know, 
have your own business. You don't have to have a college degree to join. Um, All you need to do is either be in the field or looking for a job to be able to attend. When you work with nonprofits, do they also come to y'all addressing some of the needs that they have with their organization in order for them to serve their community? Absolutely. So beyond, obviously, every nonprofit needs more money, and that's um, that's common. One of the things that um, I would like to also mention, what we do as an organization is once a quarter, we also organize uh, service projects with local nonprofits. Another thing that I've learned is that many people want to contribute and give back and volunteer beyond just giving money. So they actually want to physically do it, but oftentimes they don't know where to start. And so once we start facilitating, you know, a a networking um, through networking event to organize service projects, then we have a community who comes together. So we have volunteered at um, with like Girl Scouts of Atlanta, where um, they had an award ceremony and we were helping them set up. Um, We volunteered with Atlanta Mission, which is a local homeless shelter where we played games with children and did, um, you know, arts and crafts with women. Um, We're about to do another um, service project with a local nonprofit that gathers um, children in need and gives them uh, Christmas gifts. So now beyond just, you know, monetary support, beyond just them talking um, and spreading the mission, we're also known as this community that not doesn't just meet once a month, but also goes into the community to support, to help, to build um, and really growing in that stronger tie with local nonprofits. With your effort that you are pushing out there for helping people, not just heal, but to serve and to play a part, play a role inside the community. I mean, from your background, I mean, it's safe to say you're doing a lot more than people who are here, right here in the United States. How important is it for you to to show people what is possible with not just your vision, but with your, you know, your mission? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think like I use my story as that beacon of hope for many people, because especially as they, you know, read my book and they learn the kind of environment where I, you know, I was abused. I was hunger. I, I mean, and the fact from where I come from to where I'm now, sometimes, you know, I have a hard time believing that, you know, I'm here today. Um, But anything is possible if you really are trying to do good. And here's an interesting thing is because people feel how genuinely I care about doing good, helping, bringing the community, it lights them up. So there's, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing seeing suddenly this new partnerships happening between businesses and nonprofits and just, um, how people starting to collaborate um, and and that grow, growth will be multiplied, right? The bigger we are, we're less than a year old organization. And this is already the kind of impact we're able to provide. Like I can only imagine what can we do in five, 10 years, right? And so that's why I have that big vision to grow really nationwide because there is such a need in every major city, you know, we can really make an impact on our, on our whole country. If we come together. This on refocus radio talking to our guest on a Meg Rellis Valley. You can go to her website, CP of ATL.com. Can't help to think the success that you have with your organization is direct reflection to what you were able to accomplish after you got to the United States. And with that said, You mentioned that you are seeing it expand throughout America, these new chapters of your organization. Mm -hmm. What do you hope can happen in the United States with, you know, direct impact from your organization's efforts? Yeah, I just, I think twofold. I think a lot of people struggle with feeling lonely. Um, I hope that my organization will help 
people to find that sense of belonging, community, friendships um, that they're lacking. A lot of people are lacking that. So my hope is for that to happen. Um, And then for us to also provide significant financial and, um, you know, resource support to all the small um, and mid-sized nonprofits in the communities where we um, establish chapters. So, um, yeah, I'm hopeful to find strong um, partners in in other states who will take the torch and will continue the growth with me. You listen on Refocus Radio, talking to our guest on a Meg Railers Valley, and go to her website is cpofatl.com. What's a call to action that you would like our listeners to to take after they, you know, check out your website and everything you're doing? Yeah, so I'm looking for, like I said, partners in um, different states outside of Georgia to start expanding starting next year. So if you're someone who thinks that you want to partner um, and start a chapter in your city, um, I would love for you to um, send me an inquiry through the website. Once again, I want to say thanks to you, Anna, for your time. Thank you so much.